All right, welcome to this morning's webinar. People are filing in. We're going to give this a little bit of time for people to join and enter our webinar room. But if you're here for the webinar on Sheikh Jarrah, you're in the right place. If you're not here for the webinar on Sheikh Jarrah, there's still time to get off this plane and get on a different one. So we'll start very shortly. And again, welcome. If you are here for the webinar on Sheikh Jarrah, you are in the right place. Just gonna give this a couple more seconds for people to file in this morning as we let them into the Zoom room and then we'll get started. So we'll give this another 30 seconds or so and then we'll get started. Gonna wait till two minutes after. We're at one and I don't know how many seconds. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna get started this morning. Good morning and welcome. I am Lara Friedman. I'm the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to our webinar this morning on impending evictions and the struggle to live in East Jerusalem. Palestinians in Sheikh Jarrah, co-sponsored with Just Vision. So the struggle of Palestinians to remain in their longtime homes in Sheikh Jarrah is once again taking center stage. Settlers with the backing of the Israeli government for years and a green light from Israeli courts are on the precipice of evicting several Palestinian families from their homes in Sheikh Jarrah, a neighborhood of East Jerusalem that has been a target of the settler movement for decades. This is also happening, by the way, in other areas of East Jerusalem, including the neighborhood of Sowan, which has also been in the news lately. To give first person insights into the ongoing saga, we have with us today two Palestinian experts in the field, whom I will introduce very briefly here for their full bios. Please see the online invitation to this webinar on our website, fmep.org. So first I want to introduce Mohammed Al-Kurd, um, Mohammed is a writer and a poet from Jerusalem, and he is currently studying in New York City. Um, he, I think, is known to a lot of people from Our Neighborhood, the movie in which he starred uh, from, I think, 2011 when it was uh, released. We'll be talking about that. Um, and he has become a prolific writer with his work appearing in The Nation, The Guardian, and Al Jazeera, and most recently in Plus 972 magazine. Um, alongside Mohammed, we are honored to have Feru Shakawi, who is the Global Mobilization Coordinator at Grassroots Al Quds, a platform for Palestinian community mobilization and networking in occupied Jerusalem. Um, Grassroots Al Quds believes that the challenges and responses of Palestinian communities must be articulated and led by Palestinians. They research, map, mobilize, and network in order to contribute to the creation and implementation of Palestinian long-term strategies for Jerusalem. So um, as is FMAP's regular practice, the format for today's webinar will be a discussion between myself and the panelists. In addition to my own questions, we are always eager to take your questions. You can submit them via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window, and you can submit them at any time throughout the panel. I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A box and will do my best to factor in as many of your questions as possible during the course of the discussion. And please note that the webinar is of course being recorded. It's actually being live broadcast on Facebook and it will be posted online immediately after it ends along with the resources that we'll be posting in the chat box. So you'll be able to come back to everything we mentioned. Finally, if you have technical problems with the webinar, let us know using the chat function, which is also at the bottom of your Zoom window. And as I always say, please do not put your questions into the chat box because I'm not monitoring that. So if you put them there, they are certain to not get asked. So with that, we are going to begin. And I'm using this very light tone because I'm so happy to have Mohammed uh, here with us and have Feiruz as experts, but this is not a light issue. Um, and we're gonna dive right into it. Mohammed, I want you to talk a little bit about the plight of your family, which was gut-wrenchingly told in My Neighborhood, the movie. And I, I'm gonna ask you to share the story here and, and talk about what most recently happened in the last week or two, what has unfolded um, with this story in Sheikh Jarrah. 
Thank you. Thank you, Laura, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> you know, in brief terms, um, late October, the Israeli magistrate court ruled to evict my family in the Palestinian neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah alongside 11 other families. And I think it's very important to place emphasis on the plurality of those home dispossessions and home takeovers. Currently, today, in Sheikh Jarrah, there are almost a hundred people just waiting, anticipating the moment they are thrown out of their homes, in the streets, in the middle of a harsh winter, in the middle of a pandemic. Not that it's okay outside of a pandemic setting. Um, and they're also dreading, you know, the astronomical, the astronomical fees that we have to pay in terms of legal fees for the settlers and um, all, of, all of that burden that comes with the dispossession. It's not just the physical um, removal of your home, it's so much more. And sometimes it even leads up to a revoking of your Jerusalem ID. Um, so it's completely an ethnic displacement process. Um, and this is not the first time for my family. Our house was originally taken in 2009. Um, half of it was taken by Israeli settlers, backed by Israeli police and the Israeli government ultimately, um, alongside four other families. Um, and it's also not the only home in Jerusalem that's facing this threat. But what's so, I wouldn't say unique, but what's so pressing about Sheikh Jarrah is that it's, it's a nonstop, um, framework of dispossession that has been framed as a legal battle, which I can talk about more extensively later. But yeah, thank you. I think that's a that's a great introduction to the to the crisis that we're dealing with here. Ferus, can you talk more about this crisis, and specifically with Muhammad's family? What is the status of the effort, and and the other families? How many are they? How many people? And and where does this stand in courts today? Yes, specifically in this case, we are now talking about 12 families that are awaiting the answer uh, of the district court for their appeal on the eviction order that the magistrate court has issued uh, uh, recently. Um, but we are talking about many more families that are facing eviction uh, within other legal cases. Uh, I think it's important also to highlight that this is part of a bigger picture of, of dispossession and eviction and displacement uh, uh, of all Palestinian families in the Sheikh Jarrah. I mean, Sheikh Jarrah is, is a, a big neighborhood with many different legal cases and, and specific uh, uh, stories. But in this case, we are talking about 12 families who are part of the original 28 families of Palestinian refugees uh, uh, who were promised homes in Sheikh Jarrah by the Jordanian uh, authorities in, in 1956. They never got the uh, deeds to these homes, and that is why today they are facing the eviction from these homes. And, and we can elaborate about this, of course, uh, later. So actually, this is a great lead in because I, what I wanted to ask you next is actually to elaborate on Sheikh Jarrah a little bit more so people understand because it is a diverse neighborhood, right? The, the, we're, we're talking about one specific area, which was, is a neighborhood of refugees who were settled there by the Jordanians, but there's other areas of Sheikh Shara that are also being targeted by settlers. Can you sort of draw a picture for people of, of what is Sheikh Shara? Who are the people that live there? How long have they been there? You know, what are their claims to, to residency based on? Yes, so just like you said, Sheikh Jarrah is a diverse neighborhood. It's, it's one of the neighborhoods that were built just outside of the old city. So th there are also original Palestinian Jerusalemite families owning property in Sheikh Jarrah. These are families who started building homes there in the mid 19th century. But we are now talking about the special cases of Palestinian refugee families, refugees from everywhere in Palestine, the people from Jerusalem itself, from the western side of Jerusalem, ethnically cleansed in 48, or refugees from Haifa. I mean, uh, 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 Muhammad's grandmother, uh, uh, she was married to her, uh, a person from Haifa. So we're talking about refugees from Haifa and the Ramle. So we are talking about Palestinian refugees who found themselves in the eastern part of Jerusalem following the Nakba of 1948. And then there were 28 families who supposedly won uh, um, a draw 
to uh, 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 choose 28 families by the Jordanian authorities, which controls Sheikh Jarrah as part of the eastern side of Jerusalem between 48 and 67. And in 1956, these 28 families were promised homes in return for their refugee status. So giving uh, to giving away their uh, uh, refugee legal state, status or cards in return to receiving homes that were promised to move to their own ownership after three years that they live in them. They moved to these homes. The Jordanian authorities never kept their promise. They never make or made or gave the deeds to these families. And now settler organizations are claiming owning the land in some cases, sometimes on mostly the land in these in this specific legal case, um, which is a complex legal case again. Um, and uh, later on, we will talk about the, 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 um, the, the players, the actors in this game, the legal system, the judicial system, the Israeli government, and not only settler organizations, but this is the case in Sheikh Jarrah, 28 families, out of which four have been evicted already as Muhammad started telling us uh, in 2008, in 2009. Uh, so we have already four homes that were taken by the settlers. These are settler homes now in the middle of the Palestinian neighborhood. You walk around the neighborhood, you see their Israeli flags everywhere. You see their surveillance cameras. You see their uh, uh, children and, and uh, uh, the people simply living in, in, in somebody else's homes. This is the uh, picture uh, in, in Sheikh Jarrah. And I think it's it's really important for people to understand because the idea that you're evicting, particularly with this particular group of Palestinians, this is sort of double refugee status, right? So people came there as refugees and they are essentially going to become refugees a second time um, as in effect, you have an Israeli Jewish right of return claim to East Jerusalem while Palestinians have no rights to properties lost at any point in East or West Jerusalem or anywhere in, inside Israel. Um, I think that's really an important point for people to understand. Mohammed, can you, I mean, we're all focused right now, like we're focusing this conversation on the crisis, but you had a relatively normal childhood as far as East Jerusalem goes. You lived in these, this home, this was your neighborhood, except that it was always targeted by settlers, right? So can you talk about what it was like growing up in Sheikh Jarrah, what your family's experience is there, what your family's history is there? as you fight to stay in your home? Um, thank you, that's an excellent question. Um, before I answer that, I just wanna say, yeah, yeah indeed, it's, it's I I, I'm arguing that it's not only the second time some of us are getting thrown out of their homes. This is maybe the fifth or sixth time. And if my grandmother was alive, this would have been her sixth time getting thrown out of her home. My father, this is his like fourth time because our house was already taken before. They were, you know, because the, the journey of a Palestinian refugee is not just from one city to another. It's from one city to city to city to city to city to city. And it's terror after terror after terror until we find a place where we can settle. Um, but in terms of my childhood, I, I liked my childhood, I think. I mean, it wasn't necessarily the most classic example of a childhood, but I could carve out a space for me within it, within, within all of that chaos to have fun, I think. You know, Sheikh Jarrah was like any other Palestinian neighborhood. It was very tight knit, um, full of life. People were in each other's business. Um, and our living room was never ever empty, especially, and you know, growing up under this dispossession and under military occupation and just watching homes after homes being taken, I noticed that even the community became stronger and stronger with each dispossession and our response to these dispossessions became more unanimous. Um, you know, my family, like a lot of what Firuz said, my family, my grandmother was born in Jerusalem and she married into Haifa and then the Nakba happened and she went from Haifa to Nazareth to Shfa'amr to a bunch of other villages. Um, and then she came to Jerusalem in 1956 and the Anurwan Jordanian government gave them houses. They said, you know, pay this tiny rent fee for three years and we're gonna give you ownership of the houses. We still have those documents, those promises in writing. We still, my family still has them. A lot of our neighbors still have them. And then we settled in Sheikh Jarrah, you know, even as bizarre as it sounds, you know, because Sheikh Jarrah is so central to Jerusalem, they didn't wanna, even though it is a housing project for refugees, they didn't wanna treat it as such, which I think is a flaw in the way we're treating Sheikh Jarrah because it is a refugee camp ultimately. But you know, my grandmother was asked to 
um, plant flowers in the garden. You know, like these were the terms of living there, like plant flowers, have a good relationship with your neighbor, pay like this tiny amount of rent for three months, uh, for three years, and then that's it. But as Fredo said, they never followed up on their, they never followed up on their process, um, promise. And then Israel annexed Jerusalem in 1967. Um, but in terms of cult, like uh, family history in Sheikh Jarrah, you know, I've seen my, my siblings grow up there. I've seen my aunts pass away there. I've seen neighbors get married and neighbors get dispossessed and neighbors that I do not know addresses for anymore. I've seen, like, I, I know a lot of childhood friends that I cannot locate on a map today because they were thrown out of their homes from Gawi and Hanun family. So, yeah, I think that's a good glimpse into life in Sheikh Jarrah. Thank you. I, I think it's it's difficult to, to imagine what it's like for maybe kids who are younger growing up there now with this constant threat of being thrown out of their homes. I mean, this is, I think for all of us, it, it, it's something to really take a moment and, and think about. Mohamed, can I stick with you for a second and have you talk more about your family's battle against the settlers, which was obviously highlighted in the movie. Um, your family has literally spent years defending your right to live in your home in Israeli courts. Can you talk about that? And, and I, maybe this is a, not a fair question to ask, but I'd be interested in whether or not you believe that there is hope of victory here or any legitimate justice and legal recourse for you via these efforts. Um, I'm glad you asked this. I'm actually very glad you asked. You know, this quote unquote legal battle is one that is elongated and drawn out and has been happening since decades, since the 70s in the case of Sheikh Jarrah. And it is by design that it is so elongated because first of all, it is psychologically tormenting, like you were just saying about being a child growing up in there, not knowing. I remember very distinctly, um, my whole childhood revolving around waiting for a certain month in a year because that's when the court ruling would happen. And that happened across the length of like my first 11 years of my life. I would wait until May comes and then they would, you know, postpone the ruling and I would wait until August comes and they would postpone the ruling. And then 11 years later, September came, I mean, November came and they threw us out. So it is, first of all, it's psychologically tormenting. My mother is constantly talking about how she wishes they could just tell her when they're coming. But the other reason why it's so elongated, it's because I think Israel has made such an effort to treat these as isolated incidents, as isolated incidents of legal, like as legal battles that are isolated. It is cloaked into this, it is cloaked into this framework that there's democracy here that you can appeal this and you can protest this and you can, sue us and all of this, but at the end of the day, legal recourse for Palestinians in an Israeli judicial system is novel because this is a system that was created by and for Israelis. And it's based on ethnic supremacy. And also, let me just say this also, a lot of what bothers me about what is going on is that we constantly keep saying evictions, which is, which is because there is a legal system legitimizing these evictions. However, at the end of the day, it's not an eviction, it's dispossession. Just because there's a, a framework that enables it doesn't mean it's not theft. It's not eviction, it is land theft. The same way we can look at many examples of unjust laws, especially in the, in the United States, where things were legislated and made okay legally and were incredibly more, morally reprehensible. Yeah, I think that's that's a really important point. The, the language matters. The term eviction is so neutral and seems to be so technical. And what this really is, is expulsion and dispossession. What's always been striking to me about this idea that Palestinians have to pursue their rights in Israeli courts, um, and, and anyone who follows Jerusalem knows this story well. I mean, you have a set of laws that are designed to defend and promote the ability of Jewish citizens of Israel to get back to, have, again, this right of return um, while Palestinians are prevented even staying in their own homes. And I, I, we have one question in the chat box already about the absentee property law. So I wanna, I wanna get to that in a little bit. But first, Firuz, I wanna come back to you. Talk to me about why settlers are targeting Sheikh Jarrah. Why are they doing it? 
when did it start? Because it didn't start with Muhammad's family. I mean, this has been a long effort. And, and what has been the role of successive Israeli governments? And I don't want you to give like an hour long, because I know we could go for two hours on just this. But I mean, this goes back to, to before, I mean, before the peace process, this goes back when they had the, the Shamgar Commission and all that. Talk a little bit about how entrenched this effort is and, and where you think it comes from. Thank you. I think, first of all, that it's important to understand the, 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 the case of Sheikh Jarrah, not just the case of the, those 28 families in, in, in Sheikh Jarrah. Sheikh Jarrah is a very strategic neighborhood. It is just outside of the old city. It is just north of the old city. And it is between uh, uh, the west, the western occupied part of, of Jerusalem and uh, the Hebrew University on Mount Scopus and the French Hill. Uh, a, a colony settlement right next to it, uh, including, of course, the Hadassah Hospital. So Sheikh Jarrah strategically is wanted by the Zionist state. It's not wanted only by settlers. And, and here I will elaborate a little bit more about these different actors or seemingly different actors that are involved in, in these uh, uh, stories. But first of all, Sheikh Jarrah is a very strategic neighborhood. So it is important for Israel and not just for the settlers to connect Sheikh Jarrah to the Western side of Jerusalem through the ethnic cleansing of as many Palestinians as possible. So the, the idea is gentrification to make it understand Understandable for people sitting in the US, that's gentrification. So around the old city, there is an economic colonization of Jerusalem. So not only Palestinian uh, businesses being suffocated and shut down, but also Israeli businesses moving in. Now we have branches of Israeli chains and Israeli businesses opening in our own Zahra Street and Salah Din Street. So that is the certain type of colonization that is happening there. Right next to it, what Israel wishes to do is to ethnically cleanse Sheikh Jarrah, make it an, a Jewish neighborhood, make it a neighborhood where all the uh, uh, Zionist settlements and colonies are connected together and are all over the neighborhood. So we already have the border police headquarters. Right in front of it, we have Amanaz headquarters or convention center or whatever it is that they built with old Palestinian stones that- We should say Am Amana is the, the body of the settler movement itself. The, yes, the Amana is the, the, the biggest, if I'm not mistaken, settler movement and organization whose goal and slogan is one million settlers. They want to reach one million settlers in the West Bank. They are not so far from that goal. Right now it's nearing 800 uh, counting, of course, the settlements in, in Jerusalem. So back to Sheikh Jarrah, it's important to connect these with the settlement that is being built in the Shepherd Hotel, uh, uh, together with the set settlements and settler homes around Muhammad's house, in addition to a yeshiva that is now also being built there right next to the National Insurance Institutions building that was built there as well. So it's a, it's a combination. This is a big puzzle of Israeli Zionizing efforts of Sheikh Jarrah. Now, when, when we talk about different actors, I'm afraid that there is the wrong image in people's heads that we are talking about different actors that might be balancing each other in this picture. You have the settlers on one side and people might imagine them as the crazy settlers that are burning down Palestinian homes with families in them or the ones who are cutting off olive trees all over the West Bank and poisoning sheep and whatnot. Yes, these crazy settlers exist, but when we talk about settlers, we're talking about the settler movement. We are talking about settler organizations. We are talking about institutions that are very well funded and very well backed, uh, uh, not only by generous donors, but also by the Israeli authorities. And then we have the Israeli authorities that people also might imagine as, you know, they're maybe neutral or they're not as bad as the settlers. But here again, we're talking about legislation. We're talking about laws that are tailored to promote colonial projects and goals in Jerusalem and elsewhere in Palestine. So they work hand in hand. And then there is the judicial system that again, creates the wrong impression and image of Israel as a democracy. And there is a watchdog that is the judicial system that says, oh no, we protect 
protect human rights. But again, they follow Israeli legislation that is decided by the government and the parliament, and this legislation is tailored again. I mean, a state that identifies as the Jewish state, it, of course, is going to discriminate against non-Jews, and this is what is happening everywhere, all over Palestine, so using different judicial systems, the military one and the civil one. And then we're not talking about three different actors we are talking about three complementary actors. They are all part of one system that we, the Palestinians, are facing in Jerusalem and in Palestine in general. I mean, let's take Sheikh Jarrah, and I'm, I'm sorry this question, this answer is taking a bit longer, but I really wow. would like to provide some examples so people can really see the picture. Take Sheikh Jarrah, for example. Who are the two heroes of the settler movement in Sheikh Jarrah? Aryeh King and Itamar Ben Gvir. Now, Arya King, he is a very, he's known or uh, nicknamed the godfather of settlement in Jerusalem. He is a, right, a very uh, extreme uh, uh, settler who um, established the so called Israel Land Fund, which is uh, 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 promoting, of course, colonization and settlement building everywhere in Palestine, especially the West Bank and Jerusalem. Arya King is the deputy mayor of Jerusalem. Now, it, uh, Itamar Ben Gvir, he is a parliament member. Itamar Ben Gvir, he leads the Utsma Yehudit party. He is also a lawyer who is known for defending crazy settlers, quote unquote, in Israeli courts. So here is a perfect example of how these are not three different systems. This is one system with the same actors filling different positions, wearing different hats. And it's important to understand that what we are facing in Jerusalem is this very well netted, very well oiled machine that has different parts that are playing, different players play in different parts, but that complete one big effort and that is, again, the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from Jerusalem through dispossession, through displacement, through land confiscation and home demolition and evictions like what's happening in Sheikh Jarrah. Muted. Um, I would add two things just thought of as I just was quickly checking to make sure before I say this. It's Mark ben is also a former member of Kahane Chai. I'm pretty sure he was on the US list, Kahane Chai being a US designated foreign terrorist organization that was in his youth, but to get a sense of the politics of the person. The other thing, and, and Muhammad referenced this in passing a minute ago, um, when, when you said Muhammad that people risk not only losing their homes, but they risk potentially losing their Jerusalem IDs. So when people are talking about recourse to Israeli courts and Israeli law, it's worth remembering the Palestinians who live in Sheikh Jarrah, who've been there since before, you know, before 1948, many of them, since the 50s here, since before 67 for sure, aren't Israeli citizens. Um, they have Israeli residency, which in theory, you know, grants them the privilege of living in Israel, but not the rights of full citizens. And uh, there's a constant, I mean, I don't know if either of you want to talk about this, it's a, not something we had on our, we had decided to talk about, but this idea that Palestinians in East Jerusalem can become citizens like that if they want to is actually not true. Um, so it, it, it's, you're not even full status in court. So it's a, it's a very problematic idea that there's going to be justice in Israeli courts there. Um, staying with you Perus, for a second, can you, going back to the last question I asked Mohammed, I mean, looking at these specific cases, which are sort of the catalyst for today's conversation, do you think there's any hope of stopping these, <laughs> these um, dispossessions, um, these expulsions in the shorter long term? And, and is there any sort of relief for these families who are living in perpetual limbo um, under, under attack from, from these efforts? Uh, yeah, I think that Mohammed already kind of answered this question that the, when his mom says, I wish they'd just tell me when they're coming. It, I mean, there is the feeling, unfortunately, and very sadly, that this uh, temporary freeze on the eviction order is just a temporary freeze and eventually the, the order will uh, uh, come out again. And this is the case of Palestinians in the Israeli judicial system all the time. It is, as Muhammad was saying, it is draining, it is exhausting, and not only, of course, materially and financially, but also psychologically. But imagine it is uh, uh, um, um, 
it's important to understand that the judicial system uh, follows the Israeli legislation. And when it comes to Israeli legislation about Jerusalem especially, and about Israeli, uh, sorry, Palestinian legal status in Jerusalem and ownership rights in, in uh, over properties in Jerusalem, then clearly the Israeli laws were designed in order to promote the Israeli officially dictate, de declared goal for Jerusalem, which is having a Jewish majority of 70%. Uh, I mean, when, when a, a, a state, of course, it doesn't miss the chance to show off being the only democracy in the Middle East, but look at its uh, uh, legislation, its laws, its policies. It's very, very, very undemocratic. And this is like me being generous. And uh, uh, um, then you look at the legislation, you look at the laws, you look at what rules is this judicial system going to follow and, and to go by. And then you realize that we are not the underdogs. We are, we lose the case before even going to court. But this is what Palestinians do because this is their last resort, going to the Israeli court, usually knowingly that this is only to halt an eviction or a demolition. This is just a temporary pushing you know, back uh, 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 the day. But eventually, it is statistically also clear that we lose cases in in this system and it's not surprising it shouldn't be surprising that we have we don't stand a chance at the israeli courts because eventually again they are part of the system that is designed in order to push us out to dispossess us and push us out so unfortunately there isn't much hope legally and and um uh, looking at so many other cases of, of land confiscation, when your land is confiscated for a national park plan, for example, or uh, when, you, when you get a demolition order over a house because you supposedly built it without a permit that you were denied systematically by the Israeli uh, 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 authorities, then you see how it is a puzzle. And so you have the authorities making the rules that we don't stand a chance. And then we try to advocate and then we try to use whatever tools we have. Usually this costs us a lot of money, a lot of life and time, a lot of emotions. And eventually, unfortunately, we also still lose. So that's the case and that's the feeling. And that's why many Palestinians you know, sometimes you do it really because it's your last resort, but many Palestinians stopped even trying to go to court in, in so many other cases. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me. I remember years ago when I was first working in Israel-Palestine, coming across the, the term, which was rule of law versus rule by law. Um, and the idea that there, there can be a system where everything is legal, but the, the laws have been written to achieve a specific goal and then you say it's legal and i'll also add you know i lived in jerusalem in, in the early 90s and i lived in shafat and i remember at the time they started building a huge settlement right next to my the neighborhood i was living in which was called Rechesh shafat and it became ramat shlomo and i remember digging into the history of that settlement and that land had been seized in i think 68 by israel from the village of shafat as a protected land for like park, like a protected area. And then at some point they just rezoned it, but then they gave it for a settlement. So it was taken from the village for a different reason. And then again, rule by law, we've changed our mind and legally we can rezone it, but now it's not used for the Palestinians have lost all claim to it. It was quite shocking to me as an American at the time. Um, I, I was naive then. If I may um, just add to this uh, just one or two sentences, looking at planning, urban planning policies in Jerusalem, you see this happen over and over again. You know, the, the, the land is privately owned Palestini from, by Palestinians. It is confiscated and declared as a green zone, open scenic area or uh, na designated for a national park. By the way, the land, which is also just outside my window that you are referring to, uh, uh, was also designated once or decided once to be to become the Jerusalem football stadium, soccer stadium, Teddy, which later moved on to Al Malhalans in in the in the south. So you see how uh, um, uh, very systematically planning, developing Palestinian communities, building Palestinian homes or developing Palestinian commercial centers does not happen 
very systematically, while on the same lands, what happens is dispossession and building more colonies and colonial projects like settler roads and industrial zones and malls. Now, next to uh, Shu'fat on the other side, there is a Rami Levy Mall, which is uh, a, a, an Israeli economic colony in this case. So clearly, the designing of the, the, the city itself follows those uh, uh, col colonial goals. Yeah. Um, Mohammed, I want to come back to you. Um, so I've got a couple of questions, but I want to start with, so I, you know, I and a lot of the world with, you know, 2009, this sort of started to heat up. And I think the footage in, in the movie is from 2009. It was released a little bit later. And at that time, there was rallying support. I remember there were people, pro Israelis protesting in Sheikh Sharat, you know, trying to defend against this. Can you talk about what happened back in that era that actually was maybe effective in preventing, you know, full expulsion at the time and drawing people's attention? And, and what you think, you know, the international community and others can be doing um, to help stop the expulsion now? Um, so in 2009, when our house was first taken alongside three other homes, um, partially in 2008, the rest of them in 2009, what started the movement to save Sheikh Jarrah from dispossession was, you know, the women of my neighborhood who opted to use the pots and pans in the houses and go out in the streets and protest um, what is going on. And that catalyzed and got a lot of people going. Um, a lot of people started to come to Sheikh Jarrah and protest with us, which um, generated a lot of media attention, which in turn created international outrage. But I wouldn't say that those things stopped. Um, you know, My Neighborhood is one of the many documentaries made, maybe one of the better knowns, but one of the many documentaries made about Sheikh Jarrah. There was a lot of conversation internationally about Sheikh Jarrah. And still, it didn't stop the evictions. It halted them for a few years. And as we see, we are still back into the grinding machine, which kind of proves my point that I made earlier about how it is intentionally drawn out. I think, I believe Israel understands the news cycle. They understand how journalism works. They understand how people's solidarity work. Um, people will get tired. People will come to Sheikh Jarrah for a year, for two years, and then khalas, it's no longer a hot button issue. It's no longer uh, an urgent crisis. And they go, and then another village is attacked, and people go there, and people forget about Sheikh Jarrah, and the residents of Sheikh Jarrah are the ones left to deal with all of the aftermath. But it's not an anomaly. It's not. It's not. Um, it's not a unique case. This is not just Sheikh Jarrah. It's. It's the way they operate. They. They give us the information that we're getting thrown out of our home. We make a fuss about it. And then they disappear for a few months, a year, two years. And then when they finally come to throw us out of our home, we've already made a fuss. Not everybody's interested in, in, in listening about children anymore because it's out of the news cycle, which is why I am working alongside a lot of my friends um, and allies working really hard to try to create another international like media campaign against this possession in Sheikh Jarrah. But I think it's important, it's so necessary, and I can talk about this a little bit more later, but I think it's so necessary for us to escape this framework of legality when we talk about Sheikh Jarrah and to escape this, you know, my family is suffering. My family has suffered, not for the 11 years since 2000, um, since 2009, my father has suffered four years even before the establishment of Israel. He has suffered all of his life my grandmother as well, my family is suffering, but the tragedy, the human tragedy of my family is not the end all be all of this situation. What it is, is that my family is likely going to be thrown out of our home in the streets. And because it's our home, we're going to protest it. And we're going to put up a tent and sit in the tent. And because we live in Jerusalem, an increasingly gentrified city, the Jerusalem municipality will come and say that it's illegal for us to have a tent and then we'll not have a tent and the winter is going to harden and we're inevitably going to have to move to the West Bank and we're going to lose our Jerusalem IDs. And the thesis in here, the, 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 the breaking news about this is that this human tragedy is not just mine. This is likely going to happen to many families um, after my family. And this is like, and this has happened thousands and thousands of times to many, many families whose homes were demol demol demolished or taken over. 
So I think in order for us to kind of mobilize our efforts as an international community, we have to start thinking about this as an issue of disposition, as an issue of ethnic displacement, not just an eviction that is happening because of a flaw in the Israeli legal system. No, this is happening because of the design of the Israeli legal system. Um, and to answer this a little bit more materially in terms of what the international community can do, you know, Israel, is, Israel receives $3.8 billion in aid every year from the United States. I don't think there is a bigger punchline than that. I think there's nothing more tangible than that. I think the American people, if they were able to understand, um, if the American people had the chance to observe what is going on, I am assertive they wouldn't want to be spending $3.8 billion in military aid for to Israel every year to demolish me and my to demolish my home and dispossess me and my family and thousands of other families. I say this in addition to the fact that we are in a pandemic where working class American families are struggling, where Flint doesn't have clean water, where the healthcare system is crumbling. So I think it's a very obvious equation and I think it doesn't take much to figure out. It's a really, it's a really powerful point. And I, I also, I mean, you make a really important point, which I think is worth repeating. I mean, this webinar is about the case overall. We're focusing on you in large part because you and your family have, have been able to elevate these ideas and make people stand up and take notice, but it isn't just about you and you've never made it just about you. I would also say when we're talking about I mean, you haven't used the word on this webinar, you use it in your article. We talk about ethnic cleansing, right? The, this, this evacuation, this expulsion of people, it isn't even just theoretical. The, around the US election day, we saw an entire community um, erased in the Jordan Valley, and it was all legal. Um, we see Han al Ahmar, um, which again, this is one of those cases where the international community got very, very engaged against the expulsionist community that's just outside of Jerusalem. Um, but if you talk to, to people in, you know, in Brussels, the Europeans became very engaged in stopping the expulsion. They're very clear. Everyone says, well, it's going to happen eventually. And by the time it happens, there's not a lot of energy and political capital left to spend because you spent it before delaying it. And it's a very effective, if, if it's not an, a, a deliberate tactic, it end, which it may well be, even if it's not, it's a very effective way of, of, of sort of whittling down opposition. So by the time you actually do something, there's no opposition left which is exhausting to even think about. Mohammed, I wanna stay with you um, and have you talk about some of the ideas that were in your most recent article, um, which is entitled, Why Are Palestinians um, Being Forced to Prove Their Humanity? And I said to you before, I found this article um, just breathtaking, like, it, like a punch in the gut. You know, I know the things you're talking about. Can you talk about a little bit your ideas here and, and particularly, your experience because you are, I think, widely seen as a very um, attractive voice in how you have come at this, because how you've engaged the international community. You've been, been just so constructive and peace loving and all that, which is awesome. Talk about why that is problematic and how even with that approach, you've had your reception has been, I think, uh, shocking from some people. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that question. I'm glad I can answer it. Um, in very concrete terms. Somebody can look at me and see me, see my eyes, see my mouth, see my face and not see a human being. That is not somebody worth engaging. Fundamentally, I do not understand why there's a burden for Palestinians to constantly have to humanize ourselves. And in that humanization, we are shrinking ourselves and we are showing ourselves as victims and victims through and through and people who are armless and people who are without advocacy. And while these things are true in terms of statistics and in terms of who has arms and who doesn't have arms and who is the occupier and who's occupied, Palestinians should be able to carry themselves in the struggle as people who can advocate for themselves. You know, if, if my house is taken, I'm allowed to be outraged about it. I'm allowed to call the people who are taking it, whatever they need to be called. I am allowed to say whatever I want to say about it. What frustrates me is not the advocacy for Sheikh Jarrah, because that is something that I am going to do for the rest of my life. And it's also something that I have the privilege to do as a person who speaks English in the United States. 
and as a person who has a privilege to have access and people who want uh, and people who want to listen to me so i'm going to like if i'm giving a, if i'm given a platform i will speak against this position that is out of the question what bothers me is that is the negotiations that take place before i can even speak out the, about the disposition when i talk about my house being taken in jerusalem people are so shocked it's such a bizarre thing when in fact it shouldn't be bizarre but it is so bizarre because people refuse to think of israel as a colonial state to use a term um, most of Amer most americans will be um, familiar with apartheid and i say apartheid very very generously you know israel is far more than an apartheid state but there is clear clear evidence that israel is not a democratic state that israel has an agenda has had an agenda for decades to completely erase Palestinian presence from, from Jerusalem, from Palestine at large. And I do not, I'm not interested in negotiating that fact. It is a fact. The Nakba is a fact, the fact that we were expelled from our homes in, in, in 1948 and never stopped being expelled from our, ho uh, from our homes, expelled from our homes is a fact. I am not interested in negotiating that fact. And I'm also not interested in, interested in trying to appease people from a legal standpoint. What is happening here is that our houses are getting taken. And I'm so tired of having to qualify that takeover of the house with citing my little sister having a panic disorder and my father being almost 80 years old and my mother worrying because these are the things that human beings will feel. All, all of my American friends, all of the people watching can imagine, I'm sure they can, they, they probably couldn't feel it, but they can imagine if 80 soldiers like from head to toe covered in ammunition just knocked down the doors and forcibly threw you in the streets, scraped your body with the concrete. You can imagine how dehumanizing that is. You can imagine how undignifying that is. You don't need, you don't need to put the burden on me to convince you of my humanity. If you are having me, and I say this, I say you obviously broadly, but if you are having me as a person to speak about an anti-Palestinian dispossession, you need to hear me speak about the policies. You need to hear me speak about the, the strategies. You need to hear me speak about our resistance. I am, I, I can talk about the grief because, but the grief is so adamant and obvious that it doesn't, it doesn't need much explanation. But you know, the need for humanization stems from the fact that there is dehumanization. And if we don't address the dehumanization directly, which is Israel, we are always going to have dehumanized people. We are always going to have undignified people. So I, I wrote the 972 essay because I wanted people to shift their attention from the, from the framework of you know, how sad and heartbreaking such things are, which they are, they're very sad and heartbreaking. And, you know, we can pretend to be desensitized to them, but we are not. We are living in constant fear and agony and anxiety. But at the same time, if we keep our attention to that human aspect, and we, if we keep burdening Palestinians um, with having to humanize themselves because people are too racist to see them as human beings, we are missing the point entirely. We are missing the point that there's a system, a well-oiled system, like Feroz said, that is working day and night, 24-7, tirelessly, and by design to completely remove all Palestinian presence from our native city. So that is that is why um, I wrote that essay. So thank you for that. And I want to really encourage people to read it. One of the things that I found really, um, again, breathtaking reading it was, you know, and I think we all have to reflect with humility when you, and I do. Um, you mentioned at one point that you almost cited, you, you, you cite indirectly, say I almost cited this Israeli and this Israeli. And it, it, it really hit home for me as you know, someone who is progressive on this, who's talking about it. And that sense that, well, to say these things, we have to always find an Israeli validator. So like when you mention apartheid now, I find myself wanting to jump in and say, well, Michal Sfard has issued an opinion saying it's apartheid because somehow having that Israeli Jewish validator somehow says, well, it's not just the Palestinians saying it because we, and, and it's such a, it, it's, it's so dehumanizing, right? to not just say Palestinians can talk about this in their own terms, this is their lived experience. And it's even more of a problem, I think, right now, when you have things like an international effort to promote a definition of anti-Semitism, which literally defines the Palestinian lived experience as anti-Semitic. I mean, that's where we're moving to.
So I, I hope people will read this essay and, and really take a step back and, and reflect on what it means to hear people talk about their experience and, and, and regard them as human enough to believe them in their terms and not, not disbelieve them unless you can find a real human <laughs> to validate it. I think it's incredibly important and, and thank you for that, for writing it. Um, Firuz, I wanna ask you a question, which again, this is more from the, what we're seeing in the Q and A. I want to ask you to unpack a little bit the legal framework that lets this all happen. Um, and I want to, I, I know this is again, something that could go on for hours, but, but you, there's these laws, there's the absentee property law, there's residency rules, there's building rules. Can you unpack a little bit, what is the framework that enables this dispossession? Yes, so again, specifically speaking about Sheikh Jarrah, we are talking about claims that land or homes were owned by Jewish people in, in, in this side, the eastern part of Jerusalem, prior to the Nakba. And uh, since we're talking about the legal framework, I mean, first of all, speaking about these refugees in Sheikh Jarrah, you know, one uh, person I met there once said, you know what, I don't want this house in Sheikh Jarrah. I want to go back to Lid. She's a refugee from Lid. And she says, why? Why, why are Jewish people allowed to reclaim or return uh, to, to their uh, pr property? Now, again, leaving the discussion whether this is factually true or not, because there is a discussion on, on those claims of ownership, whether of the land or, or homes in Sheikh Jarrah. But again, it's important to highlight the double standard that is using, used, being used here. Uh, uh, Palestinian refugees cannot claim their property that is in 48 occupied lands legally. We cannot. Uh, my grandfather couldn't reclaim his lands around uh, uh, Imm al-Fahim or Nazareth. Uh, Muhammad's grandfather and mother cannot claim back their homes in Haifa or Nazareth or anywhere else they were expelled from. While Jewish people can use this legal uh, uh, right uh, uh, that is supported by the Israeli judicial system that accepts this. Uh, uh, and so there is the case of double standards here. But again, look at it on the wider bigger picture. The whole idea of return, one of the first laws that were legislated uh, following the Nakba is the, the Israeli so-called law of return that speaks about the return of any Jewish person, whether they were ever here or not, whether they are uh, uh, now, regardless whether they are uh, 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 Jewish or not sometimes, but just claiming to be Jewish and, and coming here, then happily largely being accepted based on a law that was designed in order to encourage and push forward Zionist immigration to Palestine. So any person who can prove that they are Jewish can come here very easily, very be very welcome and receive the citizenship uh, legal status, receive help uh, by the so-called absorption uh, agency and become Israeli. But Palestinian refugees who were expelled fr from their land and from their homes, people who can still even legally prove that they own these lands and these homes are not allowed back into Palestine to begin with by Israel. They are banned from returning to Palestine. These Palestinian refugees today, they are uh, 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 millions around the world, almost 7 million Palestinian refugees around the world. These are descendants of Palestinians who were expelled from Palestine in 48 and who legally cannot, according to the legal system that controls all of Palestine, which is the Israeli legal system, they cannot use this even Again, I, I am not a believer in international law. Many, many, many Palestinians do not believe in international law. But even according to international law, these Palestinians have the right to return to Palestine. There is a UN decision that says, resolution that says they must be allowed back into Palestine and it is not being respected because the Israeli legal system says otherwise. So you have the return of Jewish people, whether this return is debated or not, but you there is no way that Palestinians <clears throat> can return. And then <clears throat> to complement this uh, policy and legislation comes the absentee property law that was in the question. The absentee property law was legislated in 1950 in order to regulate Israel's control over Palestinian property that was left behind by expelled refugees, whom Israel- Regulate, you, you, regulate sounds like a very neutral term. 
I don't, I think. Sorry, I mean, I mean enable. Yeah. Okay, enabling that, that robbery, legal robbery of this property because the physical robbery already happened, right? These refugees are stuck now outside of Palestine. They cannot return and Israel creates a law that allows it to legally take over these properties, whether we are speaking about lands, homes, businesses, even bank uh, accounts back then in 1948. And these are uh, deemed by the Israeli law absentee properties. Again, absentee, a very neutral wor word that uh, entails that these Palestinians are just, you know, uh, absent on their own uh, terms, because based on their own will. And the until their return, the Israeli authorities control their property. This is the language in the law. Now, you can do one plus one. These, these refugees are not allowed to return to Palestine, which means Israel controls their property indefinitely. Now, this property, absentee property law was uh, uh, um, first used in 48 occupied lands and was applied when it came to Palestinian refugees of 48 and their properties uh, uh, located in the western part of Jerusalem in other 48 occupied territories. In 2013, a very important legal precedent happened when the Israeli court allowed this law to be applied in the eastern part of Jerusalem. So we started seeing, I mean, the case of the Shepherd Hotel in Sheikh Jarrah, which was confiscated, it used to belong to Al, Al Husseini family. It is part of it, Israel claims is absentee property and now applying absentee property also in 67 occupied lands, Israel legally again, uh, uh, quote unquote, of course, grabbed this uh, uh, property and is now finishing the construction of a new residential settlement in Sheikh Jarrah added to the whole uh, uh, collection we already uh, uh, mentioned. So the absentee property law to the, to the question that was asked is now, yes, being uh, uh, applied in the eastern part of Jerusalem to those who are familiar with the police station and the post office building on Salah al-Din Street, just outside of Herod's Gate, that also there uh, also uh, Ateret Kohanim managed to take a floor in this building based on the use of this absentee property law as well, also in the eastern part of Jerusalem. So looking at Israeli laws, you can see how these laws are designed in a way, again, to work together towards the dispossession of Palestinians, displacing them. Master plans for Jerusalem speak about uh, keeping, maintaining and keeping a Jewish majority of 70 percent. Uh, um, just think of the idea. Imagine, imagine any other country any, anywhere around the world that says, I am going to limit the number of a certain population group in a certain city. And imagine how ridiculous that is going to, to sound to people. And imagine how Israel can say it boldly, shamelessly, and there isn't a question about it. So what do you mean? You mean that you are going to not allow Palestinians to grow beyond a certain number. And how do you do that? By the use of legislation, policies, urban planning, and so on and so forth. The legal status in just a few words that Palestinians hold in Jerusalem, it is called the residency status. People imagine a residency status as one step towards a citizenship, while for us as Palestinians, it is the first tool of displacement that was designed to push Palestinians out of Jerusalem because you have to fulfill a whole list of criteria that include physically living in Jerusalem, studying in Jerusalem, receiving medical care in Jerusalem, staying in Jerusalem, while you cannot do all of this because the Israeli authorities are not building you enough homes but demolishing your homes. They are not building enough schools. They are not building enough medical centers. So they are pushing us out of Jerusalem to look for these services <clears throat> and then saying, oh, we have a law about it. The law says if you move out of Jerusalem, then legally you are not entitled to this residency status. We will take it. Thank you very much. You go live somewhere else. 15,000 Palestinians were uh, 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 
displaced from Jerusalem by losing this legal status exactly this way. So it's important to see that even when the language is neutral or the language sounds like your own country and not like the US uh, is, is a great country when it comes to laws and, and citizen rights, but I think that uh, uh, many times people hear uh, uh, um, uh, familiar terms and think, yeah, this is the case in any democracy. Well, in this so-called democracy, it is designed to push Palestinians out. Yeah, and I, and I would add, I mean, for when Americans hear this, I think if most Americans face the prospect of if you go and live in France for a year and study French, you may lose your right to return to your home because you don't live here anymore. I mean, that's just nonsensical. I'd also add for people who are listening to Feruz and don't know this issue quite as well in the legal stuff, you know, the, the question of rule by law has been really illustrated quite, quite openly um, by the Israeli government in the past few years with their efforts to legalize Isra uh, Israeli settlers' actions in the West Bank that were done in contravention of Israeli law. And effectively, when they ran out of all possible bureaucratic ways to legalize the illegal acts of the settlers, they changed the law. <laughs> they literally wrote legislation to suspend rule of law to allow things that are illegal to now become legal. Um, it, it's, it's, almost, um, it's almost like a textbook example of, of what this means if you take it to its logical conclusion. So we are about at the end. I'm gonna run a little bit over because I wanna ask each of you a final question. It's a similar question. I'm gonna start with Feruz. I'm gonna ask you both to be relatively brief because we're hitting the end. I want you to talk about what justice would look like for Palestinians in Sheikh Jarrah. And I know you're gonna to wanna to expand it beyond Sheikh Jarrah, that's fine. But how can the international community stand with Palestinians, not only on Sheikh Jarrah, but on Jerusalem in general? What does that look like? Is it advocacy? Is it donations? Is it education? And, and do you have any specific recommendations for organizations like your own that people should be following? Well, thank you. So I'll try to be brief. Uh, uh, well, first of all, justice for Palestinians, not only for people in Sheikh Jarrah, is, is, is freedom and self-determination. Uh, for Palestinian refugees everywhere, and not only the ones in Sheikh Jarrah, justice begins with return. So specifically for the Palestinians in Sheikh Jarrah that are now facing the threat of becoming refugees for the fifth, sixth, seventh time, justice is not not to be evicted from Sheikh Jarrah. Justice is to be able to return to the villages and homes and lands from which they were expelled in 1948. Now, justice for Palestinians means freedom and self-determination. And this can happen uh, 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 by us Palestinians self-empowering our own communities, organizing our communities, mobilizing and networking. And in order for us to be supported, people need to understand that volunteering and donating are important, but they are equal to humanitarian aid. Humanitarian aid helps us survive under occupation, does not help us end the occupation and achieve our liberation and self-determination. And I think what's very important, advocacy and campaigning is very important, but I think what's to me very important to say is that people need to start seeing the correlation between internal politics and internal political reality in their own countries and our political reality as Palestinians. The worse it becomes for people of color in the US, for indigenous people in the US, then this means that is the US uh, uh, policy on Palestine and positions on Palestine are also going to be worse. And I think that people need to see the correlation because we are eventually uh, uh, facing a, a common enemy, and that is the economic colonization of our communities. And it's, it's, it's the, the, the capitalism that is moving political agendas and dictating political realities that we live in. And I think that people need to understand that uh, 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 ordering, organizing the house, if I'm, if I'm speaking mainly to the United States uh, uh, public right now, then organizing the house in the United States is going to inevitably also affect the United States uh, positions on Palestine. As long as you have a president who not uh, longer, no longer a president, but you had a president who for many years felt that he could speak uh, 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 the way he could uh, uh, in a racist, fascist way uh, freely and be the, 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 the president of the United States, then of course this government and this administration is going to have 
very bad positions on Palestine. It's going to send aid to, to Israel. It is going to move its, cap, its embassy to Jerusalem. It's going to de declare Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. It's going to visit on an official visit uh, uh, in, in settlements. This follows the politics at home. So I think that if people don't want to mobilize for Palestine, then people should mobilize for themselves. Because as Muhammad says, uh, said before, those $3.8 billion, I am sure, are needed to build infrastructure for so many communities back in the US. I think that's a really, really powerful point. And I would add, I think more Americans are starting to understand that even Americans who don't follow Israel-Palestine closely, as they see the Israel-Palestine issue being used as a weapon to target liberal freedoms, the right to protest, free speech, all of that. And, and I think, I hope there's some growing awareness because effectively, you know, the Palestinians are already feeling the spear, right? That's coming at the right to protest and free speech, um, but it's gonna come through the Palestinians and hit everybody else too. So even if you don't care about Palestinians, the best thing you can do is defend liberal, you know, de democratic rights. And then, you know, frankly, everybody benefits. Um, Mohammed, I want to come to you, and I want you to also talk about the question of justice. And I want to talk, I want you to answer this from the perspective of somebody who has been from a ridiculously young age out there making the case internationally, in effect, campaigning, being a voice and face of Palestinians to the world. What does Israel, what does the world need to do? To, to, for justice and for peace. You always have talked, when I've heard you previously, you are, you are very careful always talking about the desire for peace and coexistence and all that. What does that mean? What, what do you want people to take away from, from this as their last thought? Well, I'll, um, I'll start by saying thank you both for the excellent points you made about the Israeli legal system. I wanna say that it's been entrenched. Palestinians have been talking about this for decades. It's in, it's in our problem, it's in our, Proverbs, you know, I grew up and my grandmother would constantly say, is a gharima kil adi lamin tishki, you know, if, if, the, if the judge is your aggressor, to whom do you complain, right? You, we, we are living practically and being ruled practically by people who do not want us there. And that's incredibly important to understand, which takes me to my second point about, about justice. When, when, it, when it comes to Sheikh Jarrah materially, the, I, I would like, not only would I like to not be evicted of my house alongside the 12 other families. I would also like to see the three other families that have been evicted return to their homes. I No, I will say this more explicitly. I would like to see the settlers in half of my home leave, like permanently leave because they have no claim, no right to my house. Like I don't even need to justify it. They just need to leave. That's my, that is my first step. Um, and you know, peace growing, you know, I, I, I think, growing up and coming to college and reading and have have um, offered me a better understanding of what peace necessitates and i love and i would love to leave to live peacefully but i think that has so many prerequisites that fedus has has talked about earlier um but for us to be able to live Peacefully, we first need to address this not as a conflict, but as an issue of a people who are occupied and a people who are occupying those people. So we can understand the power dynamics better, who is the aggressor and who is the responder, who is the actor and who is, who is a person that reacts to these things, um, to put this in very abstract terms. So I think in order for us to achieve peace, we would have to have the right of return. We would have to have all Palestinian prisoners freed. We would have to address all of these illegal settlements and all of these settlements, regardless of whether they're not cloaked in legislation. There's so much that needs to be addressed. And I think in terms of freedom of speech and talk and, pro and right to protest, Palestinians have been silenced for decades. And the last thing as a Palestinian movement and as, as allies for Palestinians and justice and freedom and peace, the last thing we should we should do is let such a racist um, definition of anti-Semitism prevail in silencing us. Um, you know, I recently made Twitter and I cannot formulate a tweet without Googling if a certain adjective I used is a trope or not. 
and I don't think anyone should have to feel that. So I feel like justice also should entail me being able to speak about my oppressor the way I want without worrying about repercussion because it doesn't matter if I'm angry at Israelis, right? It doesn't matter if I'm calling them names. The bigger issue at hand here is that somebody's boot is on my neck and I'm protesting it in the way that I can. And unless that boot is addressed, I can speak about that person whatever way I want. So yeah, I think, but also like Feruz said, this is easier to think about when, when you kind of remove the Palestine-Israel lens, because to a lot of people, this is you know a hot button sensitive controversial issue. But really when you remove the word Jewish or Israeli and you remove Palestinian and you just look at this blandly and you look at this in the context of many, many um, racist regimes in the world, you will see how clearly outrageous it is for what is happening in Sheikh Jarrah and what is happening across all Palestine. And, you know, it's funny because um, Fairu said she doesn't believe in international law. Um, but, and I say, I say a similar thing often. I say like, doesn't matter what you believe in, be it from like a point of view of morality or a point of view of international law or a point of, law, uh, or a point of view of legality or a point of view of, histo of history or a point of view of religion or whatever point of view, doesn't matter to me. If you look at the situation, it is blatantly wrong. What is going on? It is blatantly wrong that Israel is colonizing Palestinians and ethnically cleansing us. So I think people need to start challenging themselves. I say this with love, but people need to start challenging themselves to think beyond the sensitivities and really look at the material ground, um, material realities on the ground. And I say this speaking to the many um, Americans who come from family, who, who are like excited and sympathetic about the Palestinian cause and who come from families that aren't necessarily in favor of Palestinians. And I would and I say this to them, you know, no matter how hard, no matter how difficult a dinner table is going to, a dinner is going to become once you mention Palestine, it is never going to be as hard as the reality that Palestinians live under the ground. So I really challenge people to push themselves. Sorry, I went over time. That's it. No, you didn't. You gave me a chill. I that was that was me. I was trying to figure out what I was going to say to round this up, and then you just spoke that last sentence, and um, and you gave me a chill. I, I hope I hope everyone who who is on this webinar and 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 is listening and and really really takes seriously what we're hearing here. And I say this most specifically to to fellow Americans who are are Jewish who care about this and who see themselves as, as progressive and as caring about values, but no matter how hard this ever is for us to think about, it's a lot harder for people who are living under these things that are hard for us to talk about and think about. And I am, um, I am humbled and, and so grateful for both of you um, sharing this time with us and sharing your thoughts so honestly. Um, on behalf of the Foundation for Middle East Peace and Just Vision, I wanna thank you both for participating in this webinar. Um, for people who are attending, if you want to learn more about these issues, you should follow both of our guests on Twitter. I think those the, the, the Twitter handles are in the chat. Um, all of the resources that were posted in the chat will be posted on our website along with the video of this uh, webinar so you can see more about that. Uh, for folks who want to learn more, we are having another webinar in two days on the EU and uh, EU policies in Israel-Palestine looking ahead to Biden. So you should join us for that and, and keep an eye out for other announcements, which are all found on www.fmep.org. And with that, we will end this webinar. Thank you all so, so very much. And thanks for everyone who put questions in the chat box. We included a lot of them in the discussion. I will say if your questions were not inclu included, fear not, the entire set of questions will be shared in writing with both of the panelists so that they will know what people are interested in and that will hopefully help guide them in their thinking and in their engagements in the future. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you.